morning, everyone. It's good to see you here this morning. It's, uh, some people had a hard time getting here. Joyce had to try to work her way around the marathon this morning. And it took her quite a while to get around it, she, as she was telling us, going through the downtown core. And then, um, then this morning, uh, or last night, or rather, we uh, had, had a pretty good time, I think, with uh, Faith Rockstar. Uh, a lot of great uh, performers and, and people were doing a pretty good job. And uh, it was kind of an, just an enjoyable evening. Ardell and I came and we just sat and listened and, and uh, watched as everyone was sort of uh, being put through the paces and challenged. People actually, last night they had to sing songs that uh, they had written themselves. And I, I was quite, uh, well, quite amazed actually at some of the, some of the ability of, of, or a lot of, all, most of the ability, I shouldn't say some. All, everyone had, did a pretty good job last night. It was quite, uh, uh, quite a great evening of uh, praising and, and everything. And then uh, they sang hymns. And then I just realized that there's a whole generation of people that well, obviously don't sing a lot of hymns because uh, uh, you know you just they, there were a lot that didn't seem to know them. And of course they fell back to Christmas carols. So for a couple, of, and of course Matt's not here this morning. We have to get Matt, uh, we have to get Matt in here this morning in the morning today. Uh, but anyways. Uh, this morning's uh, message is, is don't lose your focus. We uh, have lots of things that can distract us in this world. Lots of things that can get in the way, in our, uh, take our attention and pull our attention away from things that are important. Like, uh, for, for instance, the, what, what's going on at church or what's going on in, uh, in our walk with God and, and so forth. And I want to take a, sort of as an illustration this morning to begin in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 verses 1 through 5. And this is about um, a, section, a section of scripture that's talking about the king of Judah. Now the king's name is Ahaz. And if you're not familiar with him, that's okay. He's, he's, uh, don't, you know, he, uh, we don't have to know everything in the Bible. But Ahaz is an interesting man. 20 years old, he becomes king. Now most of you are in that sort of age, age bracket. 20 years ago, I was in that age bracket. But in that 20-something time, can you imagine becoming the king of a nation? He's 20 years old, and he actually reigns for close to 16 years. He's a descendant of David, and he's ruling in the, in the area of Judah. Israel is already sort of gone its own way in lots of ways. It's, it's slowly working its way away from God, and uh, it's, it's probably, it, won't be, it won't last too much longer. And now it's interesting... Ahaz is attracted by what's going on around him. And he's caught up in what's going on around him. And he leaves his faith. He leaves behind his faith. In verse 1 it says, Ahaz was 20 years old when, the, when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he didn't do what was right in the Lord's sight. Like his forefather David. So his great grandfather, I'm not sure exactly where he comes into the, into the picture of David and uh, how far away he is from uh, King Ahaz. But uh, he, what we see here is he, he did not do what is right in the Lord's sight. So in other words, he had left his faith of his fathers. He had left behind the, the, what had, the, had been successful for his, uh, other kings. What David was, what made David great, Ahaz had lost sight of. And so often, many of us can get into the same position. We get caught up in what we see around us, what, what's going on in the world, what's uh, going on in our life, what's going on in our relationships, what's going on in all those things around us, and we lose sight of what the Lord would have us do. And then we see in verses 2 through 4 in this chapter here, how he chases the world. So it says, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. So in other words, he was chasing after things that he shouldn't be chasing after. Um, it goes on here and it says in, in verse 2, And made cast images of, ba of, of the bales. Now not bales of wheat or hail or hay or anything like that. Bales, he's talking about a god uh, in the area. He burned incense in the valley of Hinnom. And he burned his children in the fire imitating the detestable practices of the nations of the Lord, uh, the, the practices of the, the nations of the Lord had dis disposed, dispossessed before the Israelites. He sacrificed burnt incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. 
So in other words, any kind of religious practice, any kind of thing that was sort of popular of the day, he was taking up and, and following. Quite an amazing story, isn't it? I mean, you think about what he was doing here, and, and some of the reading that I had done on this section of Scripture, uh, when I talk about uh, burning, uh, or sacrificing his, his own children, they had to, what they would do is they get this fiery hot rock and actually place them on it to purify them in a sense. It's kind of bizarre thinking, isn't it? Can you imagine putting, taking your own children and sacrificing your own children? He's not talking about just general children. He's talking about sacrificing his own children. It's such a bizarre concept, but he was so far away from God. He was so caught up in what the world was doing that he was willing to sacrifice his own children. Just to follow the popular way of doing it. Have you ever said to your parents, my friends are doing it. Everybody at school is doing it. The popular kids are doing it. So why can't I do it? I know I've said it. I can remember even thinking it as a, when I was older, I was thinking, you know, why, why should I do this and this? Why should I follow what, what the church tells me to follow when everybody else seems to be going their own way and having a good time with it? It's so easy to lose sight, isn't it? Of what God would have us do. And what God would, 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 to, would, would to have us, where God would have us go. In verse 5, this is the price he paid. So Lord, his God, had an a had, for so Lord, Lord his God handed Ahaz over to the king of Aram. He attacked him and took him captive to Damascus. Ahaz was also handed over to the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. So isn't that great? He's following all those around him. He's following all the popular kids, all the ones that seem to be getting their way and seem to be successful. Seem to be making. Uh, you know, making all the money or getting all the prizes, all the, the, the riches and so forth, and all the great things, and then he falls, and then what happens to him? God takes him down a notch, and he pays the price. So we don't need to be fooled by the world and lose sight of what is true. We can be so wrapped up in the world that we, we, we lose sight of what God really wants for us. We can get so wrapped up in the world that, that our worship sometimes can reflect what the world is saying. Our churches can reflect what the world is doing. So often we see lots of ch popular church growth mag manuals or whatever or books, when it's our, or, or popular worship manuals, it talks about how we need to entertain, how we need to attract people, how we need to, to be seeker sensitive, how we need to do all these kinds of things. I want you to know that I don't believe any church, any Worship can be seeker sensitive. Why? Because the worship isn't about seekers. It's about believers focusing on who God is, on who He is. So, in other words, you and I in our worship here and what we're doing as we as we as we sit down and we get ready for worship, our focus is it needs to turn to God. And a seeker really can't do that, can they, until they know who He is. So it's not about entertainment, it's not about following the world's practices, it's not about doing any of those things. So you cannot depend on the preacher, maybe he'll lead you astray, for only God knows your heart. Maybe you are, you are, you are good at hiding what's really happening in your life. And we, need, and we can't know all, all what's going on in your life. And, and as a pastor, I can't know every personal thing that's going on in, 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 each, of your, in each of your lives. That's why our focus needs to be on God, so that He can speak to you. So he, can t so he can search your heart. So he can turn your, turn your attention to what's important. And draw your attention back to him. I want to jump over to 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning. So our, our example, our illustration comes from Ahaz. And sometimes we go, oh, look at those guys in the Old Testament. They, they're not that great. They, they're, 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 uh, being a, they're able to be distracted so easy. How come? Well, the reality is it's not much different today, is it? And in the New Testament, we see that in 2 Peter chapter 2, we're warned about how we can be so easily distracted. In verses 1 through 3 of 2 Peter chapter 2, we read this, But there, was also, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there were false teachers among you. They, were, they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, 
even denying the master who brought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their unrestrained ways, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation, pronounced, pronounced long ago, is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. You know, we live in a world today where we hear preachers and pastors or pastors or ministers or priests who actually would, without any kind of hiding it, deny the deity of Christ. Deny that Christ is the Son of God. Deny that Christ died and rose again. And we see people in the church, in the pews, and in the world, saying, following right behind them. That's why we have no problem with movies like um, Da Vinci Code. Or movies like set, or movies that uh, talk like or to, to suggest any of these kinds of things. Now, to be honest, I know the Vinci Code is just fable, is just fantasy, just fiction. But there's a lot of people who don't realize that, and the world is so easily distracted from who truly God is. We have people that are uh, that will get come into our churches. I remember in a, one of our churches in, uh, back in back number of years ago when I first began pastoring, we had a lady that came in and had all kinds of interesting thoughts and ways of looking at things. She believed that I needed to, came to me and said I need to confess the sins of my ancestors. Not biblical. But she had convinced the whole group of people within the church to go that way. How destructive it was. Almost lost my everything in here. But you know, it's, it's amazing how easily we're we're set astray if we don't have our focus, our attention on who truly God is. If we don't spend our time in, in His Word, if we don't spend our time on our knees before Him, talking to Him, communicating with Him, praying to Him, asking Him for, our, for help in our, in our time to struggle, help, asking Him for help when we're, when we're tempted to stray away from Him. Ahaz, if he would have just turned to the Almighty God and prayed and asked for His help, I don't believe he would have went astray and off on in this whole, in this tangent that he went on. And then we go on in this section of scripture in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, we go to verse 10. Especially those who follow the polluted desires of the flesh and despise, despise authority. The whole arrogant people, they do not tremble when they blaspheme the glorious one. However, angels who are greater in in might and power, do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to, to be caught and destroyed, speak blasphemy about the things they do not understand, and in their destruction they too will be destroyed. Suffering, harm as, they, as, as the payment of unrighteousness, they consider it pleasures and, to carouse in the daytime. They are blots, and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions as they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery and always looking for sin, seducing unstable people, and with hearts trained in greed, accursed children. By abandoning the straight path, they have gone astray, and they have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Bo uh, Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness but received a rebuke by his transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madnesses. Now, this section of scripture, there's a lot of, I mean, we can get caught up in here, but uh, what I want us to just draw our attention to is the fact we need to be aware of what we're hearing, what we're looking at, what we're getting ourselves involved in. But we're, what we're allowing to distract us from who God is and what God is trying to do in our lives. Allowing us to, to get caught up in what the world is say, telling you is important. What the world is telling you is, is success. How often do we think that success means that we make more money? How often are we caught up in the fact that success means as a church that we're, we're bigger numbers. We're adding more and more and more and bigger buildings and so forth. To me, we have to be careful that that doesn't become our idol. We talk we talks about here about Balaam and 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 uh, in, uh, Craven, Craven. I can't say the think of the right word now. Not Craven. Um, uh, 
uh, images, though, idols. You know, we look back at, at Ahaz and look at how he created um, idols to Baal and how he was willing to follow these world religions. Yet, so often, I think we have idols in our lives, too. In a, in a reading that I was doing this week, I found this in, um, in a book called Revival. It says, wherever we allow any concept, concept, program, committee, goal, or commitment, person, or pleasure to take a place, take a place equal to or greater than that which is rightfully should be occupied by the Lord alone, we are in idolatry. Just as many of the any ancient or contemporary worship, worshippers of icons or images was or is. God will not share his glory or honor with, with another, whether that be a sports team, the television, a job, family, success in the church, or any other aspiration. What we make equal or greater than our, our love for God alone isn't right, is it? So often, you know, I, 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 you just ask my, my wife, ask her Adele anytime, if there's an Oilers game on, where am I? I'm sitting watching it. <laughs> not there, obviously, because because we're not that rich and uh, we can't afford to go to the hockey game. But you know, to be honest with you, I love hockey. I love football. Football season starts in a couple more weeks, and uh, I will be watching the Eskimos whenever they're on TV. In fact, the, the great thing about the Eskimos, I can actually afford to go to their games. So Madeline and I, Maddie loves football too. And this year, we're going to go to at least a few football games together. So, you know, but you know what? The thing is that that can't become my focus. You know, I, this week, I got a neat, a, my text, a TSN text message that tells me that Pat Quinn was, was uh, became an Oilers coach and Tom Rennie became the associate coach. What did I do? I, I didn't sit on that at all. I was actually calling my dad and I didn't call her down. She doesn't really care. And, you know, I got to, to tell him, look who's, who's going to be coaching the Oilers. I was so excited. I sent an email out today, this week, asking, them for, asking pastors if they would commit with me to be praying for our, for our churches in the city. You know how many responses I got out of all of our pastors? Two. Two pastors. And sometimes I think, you know, we lose focus on what's really important. It helps me to realize that, you know, I can easily get distracted other brother pastors can really get, get easily distracted. I know you and I, all of us here, we all get distracted. Let's not lose sight of what's important. Let's not make idols out of things that don't need to be need our attention. Let's not make idols and, 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 make, and become uh, worship the things that the world say says is important. <laughs> it's so easily to be, that it's so easy that we get pull away from who God is and get caught up in what those around us want us to, to think or to do. You know, I'm a people person. I like, I, I, people pleaser, I guess is a better word. I hate to make, I hate when people don't like me. I hate it when people, I, I get really uneasy when people disagree with me. And it's not because I'm, I, I don't want you, I want you to, everybody to agree with me and think I'm great. It's that I, I just don't want, I hate to offend, I wouldn't want to offend anybody. And I have to be careful in that too, because that can become more important than me pleasing who God is. If we go on in this passage, in verse 17 of 2 Peter, it says, These people are, are springs without water, mist driven by whirlwind. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them. For other bombastic empty words. And that's a nasty sounding thing, isn't it? And I, I'm not even sure what bombastic means. But it doesn't sound good. <laughs> they seduce by fresh desires and debauchery. People who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them, isn't that interesting? Things that just sort of beat us down, we become enamored in a sense. 
For if, having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated. The last state is worse for them than the, the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandments delivered to them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing itself, wallows in the mud. That's a nasty end, end of that passage, isn't it? We have to be careful that the world does not draw us back to the way of the world, to the flesh. If we've been called out to be children of God, we need to live our lives in such a way that, that, that we reflect who Jesus Christ is. You see, we have to realize, too, that, that, that we, we, we can't, we, it's up to each and every, every one individual here. It's not, to, I can't save you. Your parents can't save you. Your grandparents can't save you. The world and all it has to offer can't save you. You know, if, if, you, if you're familiar with any of the great preachers of the past, uh, Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers in the, in, in the, in the not the last century, but the 1800s, and uh, in the city of London, a Metropolitan Tabernacle. And if you go in my library, it's obvious who, who I am interested in because there's all kinds of spiritual stuff in there. Great Baptist preacher. You know his, his, uh, his, his not his, well, his relatives or his, his um, great grandchildren or so live actually not too far away from Edmonton here. None of them attend church. None of them are involved in the work of God. And that, oh, I don't, and when I heard that the first time, it really surprised me. But you see, we have to realize that because of what my grandfather did, or what my father did, or what um, my wife does, or what my or anybody else around me, it's up to me to make a difference. It's up to me to follow the call of God. It's up to me to be faithful to Him. The only place that you can go for peace, for joy, for wisdom, for true love and understanding is not found in anything the world offers or world religions offer. The only place, the only person is Jesus. Maybe you've been caught up in the ways of the world. Now it's time to come to the only way. Do you realize the early church was called the way? I kind of like that in some ways. In some ways, if I ever got a chance to name a church, I think I'd call it the way. But anyways, you know, it, we, we have only one way. There's lots of people out there that are telling you today that there's all kinds of ways. Scripture tells us there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a believer that is straight and has been caught up in the traps of the world. Maybe you're a believer caught up in the philosophies of the world, the science of the world, or the glitter of the world. It's time to come home. It's time to come back to your first love. If you were to go to, over to Psalm 51, verses 1 through 13, we see in this passage here, David is crying out to God. He's praying to the Father and saying, Lord, help me return to the joy of my salvation. Help me to return to what was my first love. Help me return to you. See, David, a man after God's own heart, we're told in Scripture, strayed. He was caught up in the world. He was caught up in the, the shining things. Things that can so easily distract us. And had to come back to God. And so if a man after God's own heart can have those times, I'm sure each and every one of us here can have those times. So my challenge to you this morning is to look at what you're, what you're focusing on. Check to see that you're not being, being fooled by the world. Led astray by empty deceptions. Led astray by things that your friends are saying is important. What the cool kids are doing, or whatever you might, however you might refer to. Check your heart. Make sure it's on track with what God would have you be doing.